and, and then met this other you know person who had you know and, and of course I got busy doing all many other things most of which are counted in the book because the main character in the book is based it's a fictional character and everything in the book is fictional since I didn't and I don't actually know who the actual twelve are so it's completely a fiction but all the incidents in the book are actually real and the more outrageous the incident is the more real it is the, the two things I cut were you know not you know that essential and it's pretty much an autobiography on that level but in any event back to the sort of the backstory here so you know I meet this other person and he also has this experience well so I expand the treatment and now it's I, I've got the film treatment up to 40 pages and for a brief period of time I actually on paper at least have the 30 million dollars but of course then the internet crashed this was around 2000 and unfortunately I, I had options that you know I, I was in some cases it was really kind of semi-tragic it was like 30 days away from cashing out and, you know in those 30 days it went from you know paper ballot you know 30,000 so you know what are you going to do so I don't have the money but I said you know but I'm not going to expand a treatment got involved with some other things finally about two years ago and I know the exact date because it was right around the time of the Writers Guild strike because I finally found a screenwriter to develop the treatment <coughs> of the screenplay and we shook hands, and he said, call my agent tomorrow. And tomorrow ended up being the day the Writers Guild went on strike. So, and this is sort of, <coughs> this is kind of indicative of, of the book and, and, the, and the energy of the book and some of the nice things Catherine said about I have a charmed life. Because one of the things I've learned in life is that so often when something seems a disaster, it's for your good. But you can't resist it too much. But even though I know this, I was bummed for a couple of days. I mean, you spend 30 years waiting, and <laughs> you finally get ready, and then they get the writers go on strike. And then you think, you know, you wait a couple more days, and then you see, this is not going to be quick. This is going to be a long strike. So I didn't know what else to do. And I was in New York, and I am a literary agent, but I only represent nonfiction, mostly how-to books. I don't really know, you know too much about fiction, you know, from a professional point of view. Um, so... I'm, I'm in New York, and I'm talking to one of the publishers, and he says, you know, what's going on? And I said, oh, well, you know, things are good, but I'm a little bummed because of this Writer's Guild strike, and I was all set to do this movie, and now I'm on hold, and what's this story about? And I start time, and he looks at me and says, well, I think that would make a great novel. Have you thought about writing a novel? I said, no, nah, I don't know. You know, I'm busy. I do business. I don't have time. I mean, I've got to create a plot. I mean, that's, you know, I've got the treatment, but, you know, I, I think I need a screenwriter. But then I'm on the plane going back to, because the publishers are all in San Diego. So I'm on the plane going back, and I'm thinking, well, you know, I don't have to write a novel, but clearly the main character hat cannot be this original woman, because I haven't spoken to her in almost 30 years, and I don't know where to find her, and <laughs> I know nothing about the backstory of her life. And I had the same experience, so I'll just make the character a version based on me, and I'll write the backstory. And so when the strike is over, I'll have a really good backstory I can hand off, and it'll get the screenplay done faster. So I start writing this, and in the beginning, the actual uh, original title was still the 12, but the subtitle was Memoir or Prophecy, because most of it was just going to be a memoir, but then it links into 2012 and was going to be prophecy. So the first draft, I actually even used my own name. I used all real people's names, which ended up being the biggest problem on the editing, because I had to change all the names. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> and, and remember who did what to who, and, you know, anyway. So, but, but you know, as, as I started writing, it was, like, really easy. I would just sit down and... You know, two hours, go take a walk on the beach. You know, and in the meantime, I was still running my business and doing all the normal things. So I was just writing, you know, mostly evenings and weekends. But it was flowing very easily. And um, then, and this is very interesting. I got to the part where the character meets the first of the twelve. And the computer took over and started writing by itself. This is unbelievable to me. And the first two times it happened, I erased what the computer wrote because I was like... Angry. I was like, who is hacking my computer? I was like, I don't get this. What is going on here? And fortunately, I have, I, and I have kind of a strange personal life. I've been, anyway, someone said book. But so I, my, my girlfriend happens to live in Kauai and I live in Cardiff. I find, you know, three weeks on, three weeks off is kind of the ideal marriage if it, you know, for me. So anyway, so, so I call her up because she's intuitive and she deals with all these strange things. I mean, I don't really know, you know, I kind of take it with a grain of salt, but she does exorcisms and talks to the dead and, you know, all this kind of stuff that I'm not so certain about. So, but, you know, this is something out of the ordinary. So I call her up and so I'm chatting away, what do you think, and da-da-da, and she said, well, 
Um, if it happens again, save it, and I'll analyze it for you. Well, in the five minutes I'm talking to her, because we have one of those mobile phone things, and I, you know, I'd gotten up from the computer desk, I checked back the computer, and an entire screen of names and numbers has been written, oh, yeah. which I have saved, and which someday we'll try to figure out what the other side is trying to communicate here. But anyway, so strange things like that happen. But anyway, it was about at that what the other side is trying to communicate here. But anyway, so strange things like that happen. But anyway, it was about at that point that I realized that you know maybe this was more than just the backstory. Something was going on here, and so I did give out um, just to a couple of people a few chapters from the beginning, and I got this extraordinarily positive feedback of, oh, this is really interesting. What happens next? And I was like, well, I'm not completely certain. I guess I better finish it. So I, I just kept writing, and next thing I knew, you know, it was done, and I met Catherine, and you know, she called me up and told me how wonderful it was, and I was like, hmm, that's pretty interesting. And I said, well, but I don't really know her, and, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, that's just one person. So I sent it. I happen to know a lot of writers. So I have a, a buddy who, because I represent very, very few novels. So by accident, I've represented five novels. Like I've represented over 5,000 nonfiction books. So it's really just sort of, I have a nonfiction author who insists on writing a novel. What are you going to do? You're French. So, <laughs> so, so I have one in particular, and he happened. And it, it's really weird. When you say no all the time, you end up getting really good stuff. So he happened to have written a New York Times bestseller. And he was an ex-Marine, and a very different, you know, type of person than Catherine. So I thought this would be a good balance. And I give it to him, and, and I think I, I had to go to the dentist. I dropped it off. I get back two hours later. He's on the phone. He says, how would you do it? This is a page turner. I can't put it down. And so I started sending it out to other people, and I got all this positive feedback. And so finally I, said, I thought, well, maybe it really is a novel. Maybe I should get an agent because... You know, I'm an agent, but you know, I don't know who does novels. <laughs> you know, novels. I think you're crazy to represent novels. You have to read the whole thing. <laughs> One of the beautiful things about nonfiction is you really just need the credentials and the outline, and you can sell it. You don't have to spend you know ten hours reading it to know if you can sell it. So you know, I have a different you know. So, but but a novel, and there are people, and they're successful. I don't know how they do it. They they sell these novels. So, and I know a couple of them. They've got very good reputation. So I'm in New York, uh, you know, a few weeks later, and. I'm having dinner again with another publisher, and I really have done a lot of business with for nonfiction. And um, I, I don't even know that he actually is a great fiction expert. So, but you know, because he asked me, because I asked him, I said, you know, I'm debating between these two agents. Who do you think I should go with? And he said, Well, it really depends on the type of novel. You know, it's not all novels are the same. It's like, okay. So he said, Look. We've done a lot of business, we're friends, just give me a copy, I'll read it, and I'll let you know who I think you should go with. Okay, so I give it to him. Apparently he really liked it. I don't think he actually read the whole thing, but he skimmed it at least. And he gave it to his associate publisher, and she did read it. And she gave it to her editor, and she read it. And the next thing I know, they call me up, and they said, well, you don't really need an agent, we'd love to do the book. And as long as, yeah, I know they want to do it, of course, I'm not to negotiate the deal, if that's what they do. So instantly I had an American publisher, and a very good one. And of course, because... We are an agency, and we have our own foreign rights division. I kept the foreign rights, and even and this is publishers move very slowly. So even though we had a deal, we hadn't really decided. Normally, you you assume when you ha you acquire American rights, you're getting North American rights, which mm -hmm. includes Canada. But it you know we hadn't signed the contract yet, and you know you can interpret it occasionally. No, you have American rights. America is America, mm -hmm. USA. So. Totally by accident, this is sort of like what you just found within that page. Things like this are happening all the time with this novel. So, again, something that seemed negative at the time. I have a meeting, I have a client, she happens to be Canadian, she has a Canadian publisher, she wants an American publisher, but she's really close to her Canadian publisher, she doesn't want to offend the Canadian publisher. Well, I meet with her Canadian publisher. Next time I'm in New York, she'll fly down from Toronto. Sure. So, and before the meeting, we exchange emails and say, you know, what are you doing for your other foreign rights? And, oh, yeah, we could use some help, da, da, da. So I said, well, I have my foreign rights manager. He lives in Brooklyn. He'll come over. We'll have lunch. We'll talk about it. Well, that day, at that moment that he was supposed to meet, he, he takes the subway into Manhattan. That's the fastest way to get there usually. But not this day. There's some kind of problem in the subway. And he calls, apologizing. He's going to be delayed an hour. He's going to have to drive in because the subway, da, da, da. So we kind of run out of things to talk about, this mm -hmm. publisher, Canadian publisher. And she notices this manuscript, because I just come from my publisher with a copy of the edited version of the book. 